Okay, kid. Yes, in principle, you could do that, but you aren't going to design a spacesuit that could be that easily disabled and destroyed. Hi, GQ. This is Kathy Lewis. I'm curator of spacesuits at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, and this is The Breakdown. First up, Star Trek. Star Trek was made during the height of the Apollo program, so they weren't going to use spacesuits that looked like Apollo spacesuits. They had to reinforce the idea that they were centuries into the future. So what they have are featured of new materials, a, a transparent yet completely impermeable material that would be fantastic to use and make from, but it's something that doesn't exist in our world today. These helmets are differ from, from what we expect as helmets. They're not sort of round shaped to the head. They're sort of a square shaped. They have a very wide field of vision that not only gives the hypothetical astronaut the ability to view the world, but it also gives the audience the ability to view the astronaut's face so you can see who the cast is, who is speaking. This is an actual Apollo bubble helmet. When I complain about helmets being too large, this is what I mean. This is not so much bigger than your head. And one of the tests of pilots and astronauts is seeing if they can put the helmet on and not feel claustrophobic. Astronauts can look up, look down and see their toes, look to the left and right of themselves, but they've not got a whole lot of space between the nose and the edge of the helmet. What's fascinating is whatever material they're using as the face mask. It's, it doesn't seem to be um, that type of hard polycarbonate material that we use in spacesuits today. It seems to be some sort of flexible but permeable um, and hardened material that is unlike something that we've ever seen before. All of the tubing is on the outside of the suit, so that must mean that the tubing that supplies oxygen, removes the carbon dioxide, is very, very hard and puncture resistant because you don't want your oxygen supply exposed and vulnerable to any sort of accident. So the, these are stretchable fabrics. They don't seem to be constricting. They don't seem to be weighty. These aren't heavy spacesuits. These are very light weights. The actors are able to squat down, bend over, and move around pretty freely, pretty much as freely as they would in their regular costume. Gravity. Sorry, I'm done. I'm done. Kowalski, initiate emergency disconnect from the Hubble. All right, Sharif, let's do this. Pleasure, Matt. Houston, update. Well, we have a full-on chain reaction. It's been confirmed that it's the unintentional side effect of the Russians striking one of their own satellites. The suits that Sandra Bullock and George Clooney are wearing are replicas of the current spacesuit assembly of extravehicular mobility unit. Nobody says that. It's the SSA EMU. And these are very close. Other than having the helmet expand, they're very close to what the astronauts use from the space station today to perform spacewalks. They're just tethered very tightly. They work around spacecraft and the International Space Station by climbing across handholds and footholds. First of all is the size of the helmet. They make the helmet enlarged so you can see who it is who's, who's acting. Uh, that's a standard complaint that I have with, with most all spacesuit movies. The other factor is the use of the man maneuvering unit that George Clooney used. This was a technology that NASA tried during the 1980s, and they stopped using it um, with the Challenger explosion because it was too risky. It has what engineers refer to as a single point of failure um, system. George Clooney is bouncing into very expensive, very heavy uh, equipment every time he goes around. Um, that man maneuvering unit was made to have very subtle, produce very subtle movement in space. Um, you don't want to be bouncing into 
in, into spacecraft, into the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, the laws of physics are still maintained up in space, even in the movies. That bubble helmet is very shatterproof. It was based on designs of cockpit bubbles to, from World War II, and it is molded by a liquid laminar flow molding technique. It makes it very resilient, it's very crack-proof, it's multi-layered, and it, it snugly fits over the astronaut's head. It's very important to have something that is clear, um, doesn't impact the astronaut's field of vision, but also is very sturdy and holds that air inside the spacesuit for the astronaut to be able to breathe freely and look around and see what he or she is doing. There are certain shortcuts that the director takes just to make to the point. There are no liquid cooling garments. The uh, director uses um, launch and entry suits, which are really only made to work inside a spacecraft with EVA suits. And that's kind of a problem because we'd like to make that distinction for our audience to understand that there's a big difference between the suits you see astronauts marching out to a spacecraft prior to launch in and the ones that they use actually to perform spacewalks. Alien. When Sigourney Weaver climbs into the spacesuit, she does it with an amazing amount of ease. Obviously, she has to do that for the plot of the movie, but she's not pre-breathing oxygen. One assumes that she would need to in order to prepare for the ox all-oxygen environment of the spacesuit. Uh, she snaps it on very quickly. There are no parts. Um, it looks a little odd just because it looks as though the spacesuit might be too big for her. She's barely looking over the into the visor, um, which is surprising given Sigourney Weaver's height. You wouldn't think that she would have a spacesuit that would be much larger than she. And once again, the helmet is really, really large. I assume just so we can see Sigourney Weaver's face. The other question I have is what is the purpose of the, those openings in the helmet? towards the back of her head. We don't see her sealing the spacesuit at all. We just see her climbing in and Velcroing it up. We don't see a, a pressure layer of the suit, that the layer that usually a rubber or a synthetic layer that keeps the oxygen inside that performs the purpose of being a bladder inside the suit. What you do see is a thermal micrometeor garment layer, that outer layer that we, we associate with spacesuits. And that's to protect against particles traveling very fast in space. It's also to protect against radiation from whatever source. You know, we're out here someplace in the galaxy. I don't know where, but there still are going to be sources of radiation, some sort of solar radiation as opposed to existing radiation in the suit. So th that suit itself looks very bulky, but it's similar in the way that Apollo suits look very bulky. Not necessarily very heavy weight, but, but thick and protective. I remember seeing this movie as a young girl in high school, and it was really a landmark case of having a woman being the hero of a movie. I cheered her. <laughs> Prometheus. Hey Wallace, take a look at this. Five feet? The really particular egregious thing I see about this helmet is that it shatters, and it shatters almost like glass. One thing that you that engineers and technicians design helmets for are purposely to be shatterproof. Seeing that shattering would require an immense amount of force, far more than any creature could exert in order to shatter somebody else's helmet. They test helmets for this, this sort of collision and impact. Well, the helmet shattering implies that the astronaut loses his or her oxygen supply. Basically, if you lose your oxygen supply in a vacuum, 
or in a, a toxic environment, you have about 15 seconds of consciousness left. After that, unless somebody gets to you and rescues you and gets you back to a breathable atmosphere, you have about two or three minutes before you die. Once you're dead, you will go through the normal things that will happen in a depressurized environment. Your, your gases will start to bubble out of your system. Um, you'll form icicles in your tear ducts and in your mouth. But pretty much you'll be desiccated over time and you'll be desiccated faster than you will explode or 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 expand as much as we we see in the movies so it would be near instant death and after that not really dramatic the martian I know for a fact that Ridley Scott worked really closely with NASA on this movie. There are certain protective aspects of the spacesuit that are on the exterior, which looks strange, but um, why not? It's, it's interesting. There are the caps over the knees and the shoulders and the elbows, sort of like skate guards, but these are necessary components that are embedded in spacesuits even today, um, just to make sure those exposed joints that have to be mobile for a human being to do meaningful work, but also have to be protected because they are very vulnerable and that mobility allows the suit itself to stretch and bend but it has to be protected because that stretching and bending also allows a greater vulnerability to penetration to sharp objects to falls the backpack the life support backpack is very small to my eyes it's certainly smaller than what astronauts used on the moon and what astronauts use on board the International Space Station. But that too is reasonable um, when you think about it that they made some of the systems more compact. The oxygen may be compressed, the instruments that um, take out the carbon dioxide in the air. Well, NASA's working on trying to perfect that system to make it smaller, more compact, and rechargeable. The only thing that I, I find curious and interesting about this one is the fact that the visor, there is a visor, which is basically a tinted um, sunglass, but it's mounted on the inside of the, the helmet, not on the outside of the helmet, as it is today and has been. So I'm wondering how he would be able to lower that visor if he was facing in the sun, because you really need that. I don't know if he'd reach in or that he had some sort of external button that he would press, press to raise or lower it he seems to be wearing is some sort of a pressure suit, a compression suit, much like compression shorts that you wear on a bike or performing weightlifting. And that compression suit is keeping the pressure up on his body. And then the rest of the suit is dedicated to protecting from outside threats. So he's got the, the atmosphere replacement compression built into the suit. So we don't see it. So it doesn't look as bulky. But that's something that, that engineers are working on, NASA's thinking about, people are working on it at MIT and at University of North Dakota, among other places. With the most recent Mars mission, they have sent materials that they're planning to use for spacesuits up to Mars just to see how they, how they age. And sometime in the future, we'll get those materials back and be able to examine them. Spacesuit engineers tend to be very cautious. They don't want to use the most high-tech materials until they know how they perform over the long term. They're very concerned about protecting human lives and knowing every possible alternative that could arise when using the spacesuit. Moonraker. Pause here. There are a lot of things going on in this movie. Many things I have questions about, other things that are very eerily familiar. The spacesuits themselves seem to be taken from 
suits that were either prototypes or designs from the mid-1960s, which isn't surprising, but it's very interesting. Of course, once again, they have these, these fictional man maneuvering units that have very accurate and steady ability to maneuver the astronauts. What really gets me is that these guys are firing these, the, these weapons that have no recoil whatsoever. They're firing them and they aren't being pushed back. Um, it defies all sorts of physics. The suits shown in here um, date back to the 1960s. The orange suits resemble the flight suits that pilots, high performance test pilots were wearing during the 1960s. The silver suits, in fact, look very much like prototypes that were proposed at the beginning of the Apollo program. Those sort of large, flat, fishbowl type helmets were, were used as prototypes. You see the astronauts in the cockpit of the spacecraft and they have this silver metallicized spacesuit, which is very much resembles the Mercury spacesuits that we remember the Mercury 7 wearing for their first American space flights, but it also resembles suits that experimental pilots were wearing on the X-15 as well. It's the suit that Neil Armstrong wore when he got his astronaut wings before he joined NASA. So it's very interesting that they've adopted all sorts of existing technologies and then added on these, these hypothetical man maneuvering units and these recoilless um, laser guns. Pew pew, that's, that's all I can say. <laughs> Destination Moon. This is a space history classic. This is everyone who is involved in the history of space exploration has seen this movie many, many times. The preparation for the suit, yes, it's not as elaborate as what we know today, but this is in the 1950s. They figured out a lot here. They prepped for the suit, they um, used their oxygen hoses, and were breathing inside the suits before they depressurized their spacecraft. There are little subtle things that I've noticed in looking at it. The spacesuit starts to expand a little bit as they depressurize the spacecraft. That's very important, of course. Your spacesuit is going to expand in a vacuum because it's pressing out with the oxygen inside and there's nothing pressing back in. They check their communications um, before they depressurize. They're doing all of that prep. And then when they open the capsule door, they look out. That is the most common pause that astronauts speak of when they make their first spacewalk. When they go out there, they do have that sensation that they're going to fall. And it, it is very common. You, you get over it very quickly because you've trained for it. But if you have a layperson come out, yeah, you're going to feel like you're falling because you are falling. You're orbiting the Earth at a very high rate of speed, and that orbit means that you're falling at a high rate of speed. You're just falling at a rate of speed that takes you over the, the horizon as fast as you're falling. So you're, you're not going to fall back to Earth, but you do have that falling sensation and looking out. There are folds in the knees and the elbows to allow mobility in a pressurized suit. That pressurized suit goes from being sort of slack and, and limp um, under pressure inside the spacecraft to being a little harder to push against. Um, when you're pushing against that oxygen-filled suit, and uh, that makes internal movement much more difficult um, to push around that, that oxygen and the compression um, that is keeping that oxygen in, uh, holding up against the body. Yes, they didn't make it all the way to the bubble helmet design, but that wasn't designed until the mid-1960s. These suits seem to be based on largely what we know about diving suits, 
about flight suits for astronauts and what we were pretty certain we knew about the environment of space. At this point, no one had gone into space, not even Laika the dog, so we really didn't know what was going to happen, um, what materials we need. We knew we needed insulating materials, we needed a way to keep the oxygen inside, a way to continuously communicate with the ground control and each other. Um, they need to speak to each other. A way to see. We were looking at new materials, but people at that time didn't have an idea what those new materials would be. Of course, in space, things don't have a weight, but they continue to have a mass. So you don't want to have something incredibly massive that would be very prohibitive to motion, to move around. These suits have, you know, they look like a, a polyester or synthetic material to me, um, which makes sense. You want something lightweight, but you also want something standardized, something that you wouldn't get with a natural fiber, a wool or a, a cotton. Stargate Atlantis. What are you waiting for? Have to pull the right one or the antenna explodes. Hurry up. But get it right. This is a very different approach to spacesuits than, than other films that I've seen. This goes back to that old armor style conception of a spacesuit and they seem to be have, wearing some sort of suit of armor with a helmet that actually does fit their head so you don't have that, that excess volume of air floating around that you don't need and uh, carrying around. So it, it's very different in that terms. We can only guess on what sort of fantastic futuristic material this armor is made from. It's obviously jointed, it allows the person wearing it to bend down and move around fairly freely. We don't know the environment that they're in entirely, so we don't know whether it's a vacuum or not. The exterior of the spacesuit is very intriguing, very different from from what we've seen before. What's really interesting is this use of the heads-up display, the projection inside the helmet. Um, that is something that helmet makers, be it for astronauts or for pilots, have been aspiring to for, for decades in real life. And there are problems with that. Um, this seems to overcome it by having a solid helmet and the projection on the inside, so the astronaut doesn't have a very deep field of vision exterior to his spacesuit, but he has all the information he needs is coming up on the inside of that helmet. Um, which is really neat. Really, uh, the problem with using heads-up display and helmets the way we use them today is that if you're out on another world, if you're on an orbiting space station, you're going to get s solar glare and you're not going to be able to see that heads-up display when the sun passes in front of you or if you turn your head and, you know, facing the sun wherever you're looking. So it, it, it's very awkward. But this uh, suit designer, a costume designer, has come up with an ingenious way to make, make heads-up display work. Um, it, it's like having a console or having a console on your face, um, much like you know, with what we do now for virtual reality. And that works. So that, that's very intriguing. It's, it's a different approach. And if astronauts are willing to give up being able to see their feet as they walk, that'll work fine. You just have to change the culture. Armageddon. Do me a favor, will you? Just tell Grace that I'm... Uh, I'll always be with her, okay? Can you do that? Yeah, okay, kid. Mr. Truman, oh! make sure Truman gets that! Stand in! It's my turn now. Armageddon is supposed to be set in the not-too-distant future, and the spacesuits used in it are 
pretty much in the not too distant future. They very closely resemble the basic principles of what we build on for spacesuits today. They seem to have some sort of physical mechanical compression device in these tubings that run along the, the, the lateral lines of the muscles of the, of the body. The helmets are appropriately sized, I'm very glad to say. The placement of the, the, the lights on the helmet are very good. They're on the exterior of the helmet. It would allow the astronaut to see in front of them and examine things closely. They don't have a thermal micrometeor garment shrouding the helmet, but under these circumstances, it's really not necessary, and theatrically, it's not as necessary. What catches me are the dramatic transitions in the movie that really couldn't be done with spacesuits, or you hope they wouldn't be able to do them with spacesuits. First of all is Bruce Willis pulling the oxygen supply from Ben Affleck. Yes, in principle you could do that, but you aren't going to design a spacesuit that could be that easily disabled and destroyed. Bruce Willis tearing his patch off of his spacesuit with his gloved hand. The first lesson that astronauts today learn when they're practicing for spacewalks, they put on their spacesuits, they go down into the neutral buoyancy tank in Houston, and they are confronted with coins, usually dimes, on the bottom of this huge um, swimming pool that they, they enact spacewalks in with the help of weights and scuba divers. And their assignment is to figure out a way to pick up those coins on the bottom of the pool. It is really hard to exhibit any sort of manual dexterity in a pressurized glove. Picking up coins you can probably finesse by grabbing and dragging them along and getting that, that flip, but getting something as tactile as ripping a, a patch, which is very well sewn with very strong synthetic thread onto a spacesuit, is not going to happen. But if you hadn't done that, you wouldn't have had the dramatic conclusion of the movie and you know this return of the patch back to the the earthbound flight director who had always wanted to go into space. So that that's very important for the the movie to flow, but not very practical to do inside a spacesuit. The one thing that they do get right is that Affleck falls back into the chamber and the door is closed and repressurized within that 15 seconds, so he doesn't lose consciousness. He is returned, restored to a safe environment very quickly, so that makes it easy. 2001, A Space Odyssey. Yet another classic in, in space movies. The fact is that Kubrick was good. Um, he relied on the state-of-the-art techniques in special effects, well informed by what was then the current state-of-the-art of spacesuit design. In fact, this spacesuit is very similar to a prototype that had been proposed to NASA during the early 1960s for the Apollo program. It has this helmet that has a you know, sort of a conical shaped helmet, but it has a, a very wide range of vision so the astronaut can turn his head left or right and see everything around him or pretty much everything around him. The spacesuit itself is really interesting because it em employs that uh, tomato worm design. Those are the sort of corrugated forms along the legs and the arms. And that is a method in which oxygen would be able to be displaced locally. So when the astronaut bent his or her arm, compressed the air on one side, and the air would flow to the outside of the compressed joint instead of forcing the, the other arm to go out or the leg to go out straight. So it's a localized displacement of oxygen. There is a very small backpack or front pack 
for the astronauts to control their oxygen supply. Um, the hands are in what looks to be sort of a, a rubber dip glove. Not a great deal of tactile sensation, but at least enough for him to work in. He decided to use something that didn't look like a NASA suit at the time, but he also stayed very close to what was reality or what was practical or what, what spacesuit engineers were thinking about at the time. He was aware that they were worried about field of vision. He knew that mobility in a pressurized suit in a vacuum was very difficult and very awkward. He was very concerned with, with getting it right and getting it accurate. Obviously, he's working with Arthur C. Clarke, who understood the very importance that, you know, we couldn't make this as wild and fantastic as possible. We had to draw back to our real expectations of what the future, that the near future would look like. This is my, my all-time favorite scene in a space science fiction movie. He's used the explosive propulsion of depressurizing his, his shuttle vehicle to get him into the airlock. Now, yes, it's not very probable that he would go straight in and the explosive compression would drive him just to the precise point in the airlock so he could tap on that door and have the door close and the lock repressurize within that, that very special 15 seconds. But it's a wonderful scene and it teaches you a lot about physics and it reminds you that we're dealing with a real world out there. Outland. The flashlights, the light bulbs, they're inside the helmets. Um, you don't want to do that. I don't know if any of you remember the first time you had a fish tank or a fish ball and you shined a light on the outside and you couldn't see to the other side. That's the same thing that happens if you have the lights inside a space suit, inside a space helmet. You're not going to be able to see. It's, it's blinding. You have that reflection. In order to design these suits, they would have to know what the environment is. So they have to be pretty confident that the, the pressure is going to be constant, but that the gravity is going to be constant. Jupiter's moons are irregular. That means that the gravity may be irregular. You may have different levels of gravity depending on where it is in orbit or what other moons it's coming in encountering at the time because moons have their own gravitational attraction. So this is a pretty complicated calculus to work on when you're talking about anticipating what a spacesuit's going to do and anticipating what it's going to need to do how it's going to function in an alien environment and how it is going to compensate for the variations of of gravity, atmosphere, and structure, and also construction. Building spacesuits for construction is probably the hardest thing to do because you're putting people in suits to protect them at probably the most perilous state in, in orchestrating large movements of objects and materials. Moon. I'm a really great fan of dark dystopian movies, and this movie hits it for me. This has spacesuits that closely resemble Apollo spacesuits, with the expectation that this too is not the too distant future. There are obviously modifications, updates on the suit, but it still has the same basic bubble helmet, this shroud on top that projects, that also mounts 
lights, potentially cameras. Obviously, the actor is not wearing a full spacesuit. It's a little bit too loose. It's not pressing up against, pressing out against the vacuum of space. But it's pretty on target for what a moon worker clone would probably be issued to wear. Sunshine. These helmets look like something that were proposed back in the 1950s, these giant, almost dragon-looked like helmets that were over, really overbearing, and you wonder what their function is for. The suit itself, it looks a little large, very bulky, and it has its sort of incorporated both its protection and its mobility on the outside. You see the rings around the elbows and the knees and the hips, but you also see that sort of heavy material that is protecting the wearer inside the suit. So you wonder if it's all in one or if this is closer to a spacecraft itself. Well, one interesting thing about being in close proximity of the sun is that it isn't the same as being in close proximity to a stove. With a stove, you have heat can radiate through the air. Um, with the sun, because there is a vacuum, you can get very close to the sun without getting very hot. And we've learned recently with solar probes and exploration that you can get very close in, and if you pull back quickly enough, the, the satellite, the probe can survive. So you can go back and forth just taking advantage of that vacuum between you and the sun. So you don't need that heavy protection, but you need to make your calculations very quickly and make sure you avoid solar flares. This may be so bulky just to compensate not only for the sun, but for the nuclear radiation of, of, of reigniting the sun. So this may have a dual purpose of protection, and that might explain why, why it is so bulky. Gold is, is sort of the universal, or not universal, but global reflective material. If you go to the Air and Space Museum today, you will see the, the Skylab has a gold finish on it, and that too is a layer of monomolecular gold, which reflects back the sun very uniformly. To, so it dissipates heat uh, radiation coming from the sun. So we know that gold works that, you know, it's not only just pretty and glittery, but it has a very, very sound function for dissipating radiation and light. Thank you for watching these clips with me. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time.